Rob Deerdeck was a professional skateboarder turned TV star that has had control over MTV for the past 15 years. 60% of the billion dollar network is his show Ridiculousness, which sometimes is the only show they air for multiple days without a break. However, this is not by some sort of dumb luck. Rob is a very savvy entrepreneur who has now sold multiple of his own businesses for a total of $450 million. He made some sleek business moves that made MTV depend on him for years. Once he realized they were at his mercy, he rinsed them for millions and used their platform to become the soon-to-be billionaire we know today. Growing up in Dayton, Ohio in the 80s, there wasn't much to do but skateboard with your friends. Skateboarding wasn't a big business either. It was a hobby that a lot of kids did after school and on the weekends. There were competitions and skate teams, but nothing to really generate big time money. Rob was a very talented young skater and dedicated all of his youth obsessing over it, hoping to one day go pro and somehow make a career of it. In 1990, 16-year-old Rob Deerdeck witnessed his friends Chris Carter, Mike Hall, and Jimmy George invest $26,000 into creating Alien Workshop, a local skate brand that would put Ohio skaters on the map. He watched them build the company from the ground up. At the end of the 11th grade in 1991, Rob decided to skip his senior year and move to California to pursue a skating career after Alien Workshop offered him a $1,000 per month salary to be on the team. While he was out there, he represented Alien Workshop to give more presence to the brand in the skateboarding capital of the world. Although Rob was dedicated to his team, watching his friends build a company inspired him. He yearned for something similar. It only made sense to come up with something skateboard related, so he started Orion Trucks. This was the first company he built from idea to market marketing a product. The company still exists today. He is no longer a part of it, but it shows that his vision lasted 30 years. Skateboarding and becoming pro was still what his mind was fixated on. In 1995, he got sponsored by a company called Drawers Clothing, which would later become the iconic DC. Back then, skaters had Nikes and comfortable athletic shoes to do everyday things in, but for skating, they had flat, uncomfortable shoes. Rob spent countless nights in Pacific Beach, San Diego, designing a comfortable shoe for skaters. The Deer Deck One was born, and once it was released, it was a huge success. He was earning around $300,000 per year now just off shoes, making him an extremely successful 21-year-old, but not necessarily super famous and popular skateboarder yet. Rob started moving away from skating. He was starting all kinds of businesses, including a hip-hop record label called PJs, but none of these would end up being as successful as his future endeavors. Around 1998, DC owner Ken Block told Rob they weren't going to renew his sponsorship because they thought he had already peaked in skateboarding, and they offered him a job as a full-time shoe designer. Rob was hurt. He realized he abandoned his first passion. Now his own team didn't believe in him anymore. He was only 25. This lit a fire inside of him. His passion for skating was stronger than ever. He built his own private skateboarding facility called the TF in San Diego so he could practice 24-7, which was kind of the first fantasy factory. Every contest he entered in for the next few years, he placed top 10. He was skating at the highest level he ever had, so DC decided to keep him on the team and let him keep designing shoes. He structured a new deal with DC where he would pitch them as many shoe designs as he had. Whatever ones they wanted, he would get a 2% royalty on. His shoes averaged around $60, so he was getting about $1.20 per shoe. They liked the idea. And at one point, Rob had 35 shoes in the DC catalog he was getting paid from. Needless to say, he was making hundreds of thousands potentially seven figures from DC shoes. It was also around the late 90s and early 2000s where Rob created this image of flexing, luxury, and kind of living like a rapper, but for skating. Where skating at the time was this hesh, counterculture, and almost modest lifestyle. Like most skaters didn't have a brand. Their brand was, I'm a rad skater and that's it. Majority of the skate community thought Rob was a pompous prick, but he leaned in even more. December 2000, the cover of Big Brother magazine had Rob skating next to a Mercedes Benz, woman in a swimsuit, and a real whole ass Cheetah. He was rocking iced out Rolexes. He had an iced out DC ring. Rob admits that it was a little over the top. However, he knew how powerful perception was. If he looked and acted like a hotshot, people would think that's who he was. 2000 to 2002, Rob was at the peak of his skateboarding career. He was 27 years old, already pretty rich, and focusing hard on competitions and video parts to keep his relevance so he could sell more shoes. 2002 is where he met Christopher Big Black Boykin, which would change his life forever. DC was working on their first major skate video set to release in 2003, and they were going to go on a countrywide tour to promote the video. Rob knew he wasn't as good of a skater as the others on the team, so he had to think out of the box to make his part memorable and valuable to the video. He came up with a skit. The concept was, Rob was fed up with security and cops kicking him out of skate spots while he was trying to film for his part. He decided he was going to hire a private security guard to deal with other security guards. He went to the first security company he could find, City Events in Pacific Beach, and asked them for the biggest but friendliest guy they had. Immediately, the owner thought of somebody perfect for the position, and that was Christopher Big Black Boykin. 
I have many, many different things I do as far as your deck security. Um, make sure Rob skates. My job is to do the dirty work. The reactions of security guards were hilarious because they would come out ready to fight and bully Rob. Then when Big pulled up, they got all soft and scared. They created a genius gimmick that really resonated with the skate community because everyone could relate to it. It also helped that Big Black was a funny, charismatic guy that had a lot of chemistry with Rob. After the first day of working together, they would become friends which would last a lifetime. Rob and Big Black were inseparable. They were now doing everything together. One thing I should mention is that Big already had a very successful security business of his own for about 10 years at this point. He wasn't just relying on Rob for money. Part of Rob's celebrity baller image now included having a private security guard, again making him seem way more important than he technically was at the time. In the spring of 2004, DC paid for Rob to participate in the Gumball 3000. This is a 7 day long, 3000 mile race across Europe on public roads with big parties every night that started in 1999 as a showcase for exotic cars, fashion, and the entertainment industry. Celebrities of all kinds participate in the event, so of course, Rob has to do what all the celebrities are doing. A young movie producer named Ruben Fleischer was making a documentary about the event. He reached out to as many celebrities as he could to film their experiences. On his journey, he ran into Robin Big Black, their chemistry was great together, and he knew he needed to document it. Gumball 3000, Six Days in May, was the documentary that was made by Ruben Fleischer. Robin Big Black's involvement in the film consisted of Rob bringing that exciting and fun energy while Big Black compliments his smooth, charismatic humor. Two very unlikely best friends driving across Europe. Rob was driving recklessly, Chris mooning other drivers out the window, dodging police officers. Their part in this film feels like an episode of Robin Big. During this trip, Ruben said to them, y'all should consider doing a TV show together, but they didn't think it was a good idea. By the way, make sure you're drinking water while you're watching this video. Ruben had a job back in Hollywood, so he was a little bit connected. He showed the Gumball 3000 film to Jeff Tremaine, who had worked for Big Brother magazine in the 90s, sold Jackass and Wild Boys to MTV while also keeping his presence in the skateboard world. He was familiar with Rob, he was familiar with his DC part with Big, and he loved their energy in the Gumball film. Ruben said, we should come up with an idea for a TV show, and Jeff thought, why didn't I think of that? Again, Rob was reluctant to try to come up with a TV show because of his other business endeavors, but he isn't the type to turn down an opportunity. He took the idea for Rob and Big Black, which was the original name of the show, to MTV, and they hated it. It was supposed to be a silly buddy comedy about two unlikely best friends. At this time, MTV wanted scripted reality TV that they could control and manufacture to guarantee success. Instead, they came up with a show called Rob Deerdex Rules for Success. The first rule of success is always keep a good guy around you like Big Black. It was supposed to be a positive and motivational show that would have failed miserably. While filming the first episode, Big Black went off script and started telling Rob that he could beat him in a foot race. Race. The hilarious conversation and eventual foot race down the street ended up being the most entertaining part of the episode. After MTV saw this, they decided, okay, no more scripts. Just be yourselves, be funny, we trust you. This eventually came down to MTV agreeing on Rob's original vision for the show. You will notice this is the first time MTV kind of gave up a little bit of power and control to Rob, which would become a reoccurring theme throughout their relationship. Before the show came out on MTV, Rob knew he had a huge opportunity to level up his business ventures. Bam Margera's MTV show Viva La Bam was super popular along with Jackass and he was selling merchandise and Bam branded products like crazy because of the platform that he had. He was selling triple the amount of skateboards per month than Tony Hawk. Rob, also being from the skateboard world, had been studying what Bam was doing for many years. He knew that if his show took off, he needed to be ready to capitalize in the right way. So Rob restructured his business deals to take lower upfront pay and have higher percentage royalties so i did a deal with dc <laughs> renegotiated for uh, a higher royalty i restructured my uh board deal with alien workshop to be like give me five dollars a board and give me two thousand a month instead of two dollars a board and uh five thousand a month like re restructure Robin Big, Season 1, Episode 1 launches November 2nd, 2006 and takes off immediately. Each episode premiered to 4 or 5 million viewers. The two unlikely best friends were funny, full of energy, and really just so lovable. When you watched it, you just understood. Rob would come up with the most random ideas for skits, and Big would go along with whatever. Like buying a mini horse so their dog has a friend, or starting an R&B group, or trying to time travel. The chemistry and bond created on TV was almost like you were a part of their family. With this big platform now, Rob went from 
a well-known skateboarder to a full-blown mainstream pop culture celebrity. The shoe deal with DC, he owned a 10% royalty on the Stan Smith style shoe that would end up selling millions of dollars. Rogue status was the gun shirt that he wore all the time. That did about $8 million in sales. DC as a whole went from an $80 million company to a $500 million company in just a few years with Rob wearing their gear all over TV. MTV was paying him $35,000 per episode. That jumped up to $60,000 per episode for the last season, which would total $1.4 million after all three seasons. The baller lifestyle he manifested for all those years, he was now 100% living it. Unfortunately, behind the scenes, everything wasn't as great as it seemed. After the first two seasons, Big wasn't having much fun anymore. They were filming 13 hours a day for months. In the beginning, he loved it because it was organic, fun, off the cuff, and truly just two guys having a blast. They never actually lived together, by the way. Big had a separate house. His room in Rob's house was just for the plot on TV. For season three, MTV brought in writers, made them film 15 episodes, which was double from the previous seasons, and it started to feel too Hollywood for Big. The show was called Rob and Big, but he felt more like a sidekick. Also, Chris says that Rob was being paid double what he was. Rob denies that. However, Rob was working 24-7, writing ideas for the show, and guiding the production, where Big admits that he just showed up, brought the funny, and left. We're not sure what the facts are, but I wouldn't be surprised if Rob was being paid more. On top of that, he was very unhealthy at 430 pounds. Him and Rob were constantly disagreeing on creative ideas, which led to multiple blowout arguments, and he had a new baby on the way. Big decided he was done with Hollywood after season three. He moved to Texas with his family, got his eating habits and mental health right, and reaped the rewards of his hard work. Him and Rob's downfall was relatively private. Rob never disrespected him publicly, but they didn't communicate with each other for a few years after this. Rob was ready to give up on TV as well. In 2008, MTV begged for season four of Robin Big. They offered $125,000 per episode or for him to come up with a new show. But the new show had to be a reality show. He always said he didn't want to be the old guy on TV. At this point, he was 34 years old, but the ratings were so high still, and he knew the network was desperate. He wanted a much better deal for his new shows. He wrote the idea for Fantasy Factory in one weekend. Rob was going to transform a 25,000 square foot warehouse into an indoor skate park and adult playground. But the other half of the warehouse would be dedicated to his employees and business partners who are doing day-to-day -day operations running the Deer Deck Enterprise. The episodes would be structured where Rob would talk about a business he's starting or investing in, then the other 75% of the show would be him messing around, skateboarding, doing stunts, and keeping the energy fun and lighthearted. MTV loved it. He also sold them Ridiculousness at this time, which wouldn't come out for three years and would then become 60% of what MTV plays for a decade, but we'll get to that. He demanded one major stipulation before he signed off on Fantasy Factory. He owned his integration rights. Any of his businesses that he owned could be advertised and promoted on the show in any way that he wanted, and MTV was not allowed to interfere. Because if you didn't know, any product or brand you see displayed on a show or in a movie is paid for by those brands. So MTV could not say no to Rob promoting a business that he owned on the show. But when it came to big corporate sponsorships or outside entities, they were 50-50. Since they were 50-50, neither Rob nor MTV had more power. So Rob took it upon himself to draw up these intricate brand integrations with brands like Chevy, Microsoft, and Monster. And he did all the negotiations by himself. So MTV just sat back and said, wow, keep doing that since you're doing all the work for us. Meanwhile, he was making additional deals on the side with these brands for his own companies like Street League, Wild Grinders, and other new ventures. For example, I'm sure some of y'all remember this episode where he dresses up as the Carl's Jr. mascot and does stunts around the factory. This is literally a giant ad, but you might also remember that Rob wanted to open legal skate parks around the country. Safe Spot, Skate Spot is what he called them. At the first one, a giant Carl's Jr. star that kids would skate on. This is an example of how Rob would go to a corporate sponsor and say, hey, we'll do this integration on MTV for you, but I also want you to contribute to my personal project. So Carl's Jr. paid for the construction of the skate park. Then he did basically the same exact deal on another park with 7-Eleven. You can see now how Rob was developing a lot of control over MTV because he took it upon himself to go the extra mile to set the terms of his next show, write all the ideas and creative plans for the show, as as well as control the negotiations with brands and sponsors that would be integrated on the show. And on top of all of this, he was being paid $100,000 per episode. He was starting to treat MTV like his own private production house. And Fantasy Factory was just a commercial for all of his new businesses. February 8th, 
Fantasy Factory Season 1, Episode 1, and as expected, it was a hit. Millions of viewers, not to the level of Robin Big, the fans definitely missed him, but Rob knew just the thing that would keep people interested. Stunts and celebrities. Rob became a stuntman to fill the void of not having Big's comedic presence. Drama, his cousin, wasn't cutting it. And who doesn't love a good celebrity cameo? Johnny Knoxville, Lamar Odom, Justin Bieber, Carmelo Anthony, Ludacris were among some of the people who came to the factory. There are so many businesses that Rob started or promoted on the show. Clothing companies, restaurants, a credit card for teens, a fragrance, workout products, and even charities. But the two biggest ones were Wild Grinders, which was his toy line and eventual animated series about his life as a child, which would go on to release on Nickelodeon, and Street League Skating, which would go on to be a globally recognized skate competition event on the same level as X Games and Due Tour. You could also throw in his cousin Drama's brand Young and Reckless, which he helped get off the ground. In 2011, Big Black makes his debut appearance on the Fantasy Factory. The beef was squashed, and the duo were together again. They continued the vibe of the Robin Big days, but now they had a playground and more money. Ratings doubled when Big came back. It was like a whole new show. Speaking of whole new show, Ridiculousness premieres August of 2011 to 3 million viewers. The biggest episode they ever had. It was essentially America's Funniest Home Videos, but Rob's version. Him commentating on viral videos with a celebrity guest or his co-hosts, Chanel West Coast and Steel O'Brim. So now he had two hit shows on MTV, paying him six figures per episode on both. In fact, he was making a higher salary on Ridiculousness because the show was so inexpensive to make. There have been a few different numbers thrown out there, but it seems like $140,000 per episode is accurate. They filmed Fantasy Factory for two more years three seasons, where the ratings were still great. Rob wanted to end the show with a bang. The end of season six included him breaking the world record for the longest jump in a car while going backwards, which was the second massive Chevy sponsored deal he orchestrated. The first one was kick flipping a Chevy car. The last episode, which was the 65th episode, was a one hour special. It was epic and the perfect way to end the series. Ridiculousness was about to enter the last contractual season, which at that point was the 95th episode. Rob wanted to end the show and move on with his life. He had made roughly $20 million just on TV shows alone, not to mention the plethora of successful businesses that he had started. No more Fantasy Factory, no more Ridiculousness, no more TV. But MTV begged him again. The ratings were still pretty high, and MTV as a whole was struggling. They didn't have any other big shows. Jersey Shore was over. Every reality show they started failed after one season. And this was slightly before Catfish and Teen Mom 2, which would go on to have success. He had done all the creative writing, brand integrations, and even some of the production on the show. How could they let someone go that does all the work for them? He was their last hope. Rob did not want to be 40 years old on TV. Plus, the warehouse had been incredibly expensive over the years as well. He said that he wasn't profiting off the show alone because it cost about $5 million per year to upkeep the factory. He said the MTV deal would have to be so much money that he would be stupid not to do it. They didn't want him to walk away from ridiculousness because that show was a powerhouse 24-7. No matter what time they aired it, people watched. So the premieres weren't that popping, but they would play repeats of literally any episode and viewers would stay watching. Probably because when it's 2 a.m. you don't have any brain capacity to focus on it, so it's the perfect show. And you aren't following a storyline, so it doesn't matter what what episode or what season it is. Rob, again knowing MTV is at his mercy, organized one big deal for the last season of Fantasy Factory and 140 new episodes of Ridiculousness, which would bring him to season 10 of 2017. He said that this was the biggest financial deal of his entire career up until this point, which we don't know how much it was, but we can speculate. This deal also included that Rob's production company, Super Jacket, would be producing Ridiculousness and the final season of Fantasy Factory. So now, MTV wasn't even producing the content, not filming, not editing. It was all Rob's businesses that he owned. We can also assume that because he was producing the show that his company now received a percent ownership of the show. Like he isn't just an actor anymore, he's getting those royalties baby. Literally MTV was like YouTube to Rob. Here's my show, upload it. <laughs> He got through the last season of Fantasy Factory despite not wanting to do it. Ratings were kind of low, but the show was officially over in 2015. Unfortunately, two years later, we got the sad news that Christopher Big Black Boykin had passed away at age 45 of a heart attack in Plano, Texas. He is survived by a now 14-year-old daughter. Rest in peace, Big Black. At this point in 2017, Ridiculousness was only premiering to about 300,000 people or so, compared to millions in 2012. But like we said, play at any time, any day, the audience loves it. So the ratings are still technically very high. Season 10 ends of Ridiculousness, but Rob has already gotten over the fact that he's the old guy on TV now, so he sets up for another renewal. And of course, MTV is going to take it because TV is at an all-time low, and MTV is going down with it. 250 more episodes, and a new spinoff, Amazingness. Basically, just a talent show which was very 
very unsuccessful after just seven episodes. Besides the TV show, Rob is a recluse now. He doesn't party with celebrities. He isn't doing commercials or brand deals. He's a full-blown entrepreneur building the Deer Deck Machine, which is his company that builds other businesses with the goal of selling them. The Deer Deck Machine is a venture creation studio. We are a business that creates businesses by systematically fusing art, science, and magic. He's now growing Street League, investing in whiskey, investing in VR technology, starting a protein brand, starting a snack brand, building a family with his wife and first child, and stacking his money. Basically, since 2018, ridiculousness is the only thing that MTV plays, sometimes for multiple days straight with no breaks. Rob is 60% of the network. He might as well start out the show with, Hi, my name is Rob Deerdeck, and welcome back to my network, MTV. By 2020, Rob made the next biggest financial deal of his life. He sold his production company, Super Jacket, who had been producing ridiculousness and a number of other shows for the past seven years. But the stipulation with the venture capitalists was that they also had to purchase Street League Skating. Thrill One Sports and Entertainment bought Rob out of both businesses for $150 million. Both of these businesses he funded with the money that MTV was paying him while growing and advertising on MTV's networks where millions of people were watching him every day. MTV wasn't a partner or an investor in any of his businesses that he promoted and grew on their platform. Platform. But Rob was a part owner of the show that they put on their platform. He announced another 250 episode renewal of Ridiculousness in 2020, in which he would be fully done and ready to walk away forever. If Rob's salary of $140,000 per episode since 2011 stayed the same over the past decade, with Ridiculousness having 819 episodes to date, means he would have earned $114,660,000 just from that show. Maybe he took a lower salary once his company started producing it it since now he was getting ownership royalties, but I guess we don't know. Rob today is almost unrecognizable to the man he used to be. Now 47 years old, he's a zen, calm, collected entrepreneur who is on his way to becoming a billionaire. And it's all because he got to call the shots at a multi-billion dollar TV network for 15 years straight.